In the next few minutes, we'll delve into the study of the next five lessons that form the exploration of magnetic induction phenomena. We'll kick off with the introduction, delve into magnetic flux, and revisit some key concepts from the first section on electric flux, providing a solid foundation for comparison and deeper understanding. We will also cover induced electromotive forces, Faraday's law, induction coefficients, and to wrap it up, we'll apply our knowledge in a practical experiment. Starting with the first of the lessons, what we are going to do is to analyze. In our daily life, what effects and what phenomena of application of the effects of induction we have and we use every day. We will analyze the observations and experiments of Faraday and Henry, who were the ones who found the key to how electric and magnetic fields are perfectly linked. And we will finish by analyzing the different magnetic properties that we find in different materials. There are many everyday phenomena that we find in the application of all the induced currents and induction phenomena between different bodies. There are many applications in electromagnetic devices. Here we find a representation and in both Jota's and Amanda's images induction effects are being produced. But we will also find these induction phenomena in any device for reading information recorded on magnetic media, also in induction stoves, telephones, telegraphs, maglev trains, and also in any alternating current generator. The experiences of Michael Faraday and Joseph Henry in 1830 found the keys of how to relate variable magnetic fields and induced currents in conductors. In this first scheme, if we analyze the movement of a magnet to the right and to the left, what we are doing by changing the position of the magnet is changing the number of field lines that are crossing the surface of this little purple loop that we have illustrated on the slide. If it goes to the right, what happens is that the field lines will decrease according to the study that we've done. And what Michael Faraday observed is that a current appeared in this direction in the circuit of the loop that same current we already know is capable of generating a magnetic field. In this case, said field is represented by the blue arrows. On the other hand, if the direction goes to the left, we should ask ourselves what happens in this scenario. Well, a current will also appear, but in this case, in the opposite direction of the previous one. I have brought here some small elements to perform this same example that we have just seen. In other words, we are about to see the case of the purple loop with this coil that I have brought today. A coil basically is a group of connected loops, similarly to the previous example. And as for the magnetic field or the magnet that was moving, I have it here. Here you can see it. I've tied the magnet to a thread, and now you will see why to thread it specifically. This way I can put it inside the section of my coil. You see? Now we get to see the characteristics of the magnetic field of this magnet that I have brought. Well, so, in order to see if a current is produced in this loop, what I brought with me was this galvanometer. Now you'll see that the needle is right in the middle, which means that there are zero amperes of current. If Faraday's theory is fulfilled, what has to happen is that by moving my magnet around this coil, what I should actually be doing is varying the field lines that are going through this coil, and therefore you could induce small currents in the coil. If small currents are produced, what has to happen is that my galvanometer needle oscillates with respect to the central position because it would be detecting currents. Let's see if I am able to produce such effect. Let's see. I am introducing it and, as you can see, I am indeed producing variations. Let's try again. I am moving the magnet. I am introducing the coil. And clearly there is a variation in the position of the needle. If I remove the magnet, and this is simply an iron, which is not magnetized. We don't see variations now. Let's repeat the example. So you can compare both scenarios. I am introducing the magnet again. Perfect. We've just reproduced Michael Faraday's experience. Let's continue with the presentation. Well, along with Michael Faraday, 
almost contemporaneously, Joseph Henry was also doing experiments. And what he was doing were experiments with, starting from a U-shaped conductor, what he was doing was varying the surface by sliding, as you are going to see in this little simulation, another conductor in contact that was then varying the surface of this square sphere. What he observed is that an induced current also appeared. But this current appeared as long as this variation was occurring on the surface of the loop that was delimiting the straight conductor. Otherwise, the induced current did not appear. The moment the movement stopped, the current ceased. But whenever it was varying with a certain speed, the current was produced. Therefore, currents appeared in coils when there was a variation of the field lines that crossed their surface. That is the conclusion that both researchers got. Furthermore, it turns out that materials, those conductors we are talking about, respond very differently based on their magnetic properties, the magnetic properties of matter. These properties are perfectly determined, just as we determined when obtaining the magnetic field from the parameter of magnetic permeability. Substances are divided, according to their magnetic behavior, into ferromagnetic substances when the relative magnetic permeability is much greater than one. Paramagnetic substances, when that relative permeability is a little greater than one, greater than or equal to one, and diamagnetic substances, less than one. The different characteristics that we are going to find are, in the ferromagnetic substances, they are strongly attracted by magnets, as is the case of iron. Like the one I have shown you, Let's not mess up our setup. In the case of paramagnetic ones, they are weakly attracted to magnets. And the diamagnetic ones, weakly repelled, in this case, by magnets. Let's see more characteristics. In the ferromagnetic ones, these are easily magnetizable material substances. The paramagnetic ones are magnetizable, but do not maintain their magnetic properties when the interaction or attraction of the magnetic field of the magnet ceases. And diamagnetic ones are not magnetizable at all. And examples of the different types we have among the ferromagnetic ones, we have iron, steel, cobalt, etc. Among the paramagnetic ones, aluminum, platinum, tin, or palladium, and among the diamagnetic ones, mercury, silver, copper, etc. I am going to show you this different behavior also from an experiment that I have brought here today. In this experiment, what I'm going to use this fairly powerful magnet. Alpha Tesla to be more specific. Here you can see it right here. I'm going to use this pendulum. Let's also get it started. Made out of a small aluminum plate. That small aluminum plate, if I make it oscillate, as I am doing right now, because in the absence of the magnet, it behaves as a regular pendulum. I'm going to put it nearby this half Tesla magnet. I'll show it to you a little bit better so you can properly see it. We have a little aluminum plate. This is the magnet that we used before. It's not attracted to the magnet at all. Aluminum, as we just saw, is a paramagnetic substance. Therefore, I have little interaction, in this case, with the magnet. But what happens when I take... This pendulum formed with this aluminum plate and put it nearby the magnet. It is oscillating now. What happens when I get closer to the magnet? Take a look. You're going to see it much better now. I'm going to give it a big swing. And yet it stays still there. It is very clear that the aluminum plate does not move past the magnet. It is very clear, right? But what's happening? Well, what I've got is a rectangle of aluminum. It's like it's a whole set of coils in that rectangle. And as it's going into the magnetic field that I have here inside this half Tesla magnet, it's producing induced currents that are trying to compensate for that magnetic field. We'll continue to study this in the upcoming lessons. And to finish this presentation, I just want to recap a little bit everything that we have talked about. What are the effects of magnetic induction that were experienced and reviewed by the experiments of Michael Faraday and Joseph Henry? and the different types of substances that we are going to encounter depending on their magnetic behavior. Thank you very much, students.